Nah, too love. There you are. Dear God, man. Why are there pigeons in my library? Ah, Sir Charles. If you had given me the rockets I had requested, this wouldn't have been necessary. Fear not. They're only here until they finish their training, which is coming along quite nicely. They should be out of here shortly. One of them has just defecated on an antique mahogany desk, sir. Get them out of here immediately. Absolutely, Sir Charles. Just as soon as I finish preparing them to deliver something. Why in the blazes are you using carrier pigeons to deliver your mail anyway? The invasion is over. The Royal Mail still functions. You should try it sometime. It's quite the modern convenience. I understand you're upset about this mess. But at least I wasn't tinkering with rockets in here, huh? These missives are far too important to be trusted to any person. People can be bribed. Pigeons? Have you ever heard of Cherami and the 77th Battalion? Their sense of duty is unparalleled. I will clean up any mess left over. Give me a little more time and the task will be trivial. Trivial? Trivial? The consequences of keeping these birds in here a moment longer will be... will be... You didn't come here without the reason, I take it. The pigeons should be sent out by morning and the library cleaned. You have my word. Now, what is it you came to say? Well, I... Dash it all. All, all right. I... Here. Ah, the Napier Lion Engine. You have a boat powered by one of these in the garage, correct? Are we having problems with it? Are we weaponizing it? No, gosh, no. I don't have time to be prattling about on that thing anyway just now. We're at war, remember? No, I want... I need you, if you would, to apply your formidable engineering skills to the task of adapting the lion to be suitable for use in tanks. Hmm, I see. It does outperform the Liberty Engine baseline, and is shorter due to the cylinder configuration. Yes, I can see the potential already. So you can and will do it, then? Of course, Sir Charles. The least I can do in the return for your generous hospitality. Hospitality? You're supposed to be under house arrest, remember? Yes, but... Anyway, I'm to devise a variant of the lion which retains its horsepower, yet is cheaper, more resilient, and more reliable than its market counterpart, yes? Um, well, yes. That is what I was hoping for. No problem. This will make for an amusing side project. I was rather hoping it would be your main focus. The need is pressing. The next meeting of the teabag committee is scheduled for the 13th, yes? Indeed. It shall be ready by then, you have my word. There is one issue, though. Yes? To maintain the schedule, I shall need to borrow the motor from... Beatrice, was it? I can get this done much quicker if I can work with the engine hands-on instead of just from the blueprints. If you think I'm going to let you rip the very heart out of my favorite boat, you've got another thing... Ugh! Fine! Just get these bloody pigeons out of my house! Good night, Sir Charles. A pleasure, as always. <clears throat> Good evening, my friends. Now that you've all found yourself a drink and a seat, we can get started. Welcome to the eighth meeting of the Third Party Engineering and Acquisition of British Armour Group. As members of this esteemed company, you are those who have been selected by the War Office as heads of industry who possess not only the capability and capacity to manufacture armoured vehicles, but also to design them from the ground up. Yet again, the War Office has prepared a design specification for a new tank, and it falls to all of you to submit proposals to meet that requirement. By choosing the best design amongst those submitted, we can ensure that the next generation of British tanks stays one step ahead of those of our enemy, which will be essential as Britain and her Commonwealth allies currently stand alone against the Axis forces, who outnumber our fighting men considerably. Consequently, we need to make every soldier count for ten, and giving them the best possible equipment is, in my book, at least half of that battle. Our armoured corps has been bolstered since the war began by numerous excellent armoured fighting vehicle designs, most of which were devised by members of this present company, and to them His Majesty and His Majesty's Government are indebted. The Tulov Triskele platform provides us with a flexible, lightweight chassis, which has seen use in various support roles, such as self-propelled artillery and as a tank destroyer. Until recently, it was also relied upon for transporting mechanised infantry. 
It has, however, now been superseded in all divisions, save the elite Trident Division, by this, the Cataphract Mark II Infantry Combat Support Vehicle, which is being produced as rapidly as our factories can bear, and will be arriving in the North African theatre within the month. It is set to be joined there soon by the Chard Heavy Cruiser Tank, a machine specialised for desert warfare. Both utilise the same engine and diesel fuel. Furthermore, they share the same manufacturer, Hutchinson Locomotive Works, and thus make an excellent pairing in terms of logistics. Once our armoured forces in the desert have been equipped with these new machines, we are confident that the campaign will begin to swing back in our favour, as it once was. Meanwhile, the equally successful Valkyrie Aegis, ICSV, will enter limited production to accompany the Tulov Trident, which it was specifically designed to fight alongside, in the Special Trident Division. This will be used as an elite breakthrough division once the time for our counter-attack arrives. With the Valkyrie Castellan, we are also now furnished with a formidable and proven infantry tank to replace the Matilda. However, one chink remains in our armour, if you'll excuse the pun, and that is our available cruiser tanks. The Chard and Kemp tank Mark II are both classified as cruiser tanks, with the Kemp tank forming the backbone of our cruiser units at present. However, this design was a product of the desperate situation the retreat from Dunkirk and the ensuing Battle of Britain left us in, in terms of both vehicles and resources. It's not a bad tank by any stretch, and proved invaluable in the defence of the realm during Operation Sea Lion. But it is a compromised vehicle. At the time of its development, all the War Office could offer, as you may recall, was a pair of old bus engines working in tandem. Now, I realise we have used similar configurations on numerous occasions since, and to good effect, but nowhere is such a power plant less suited than in a cruiser tank. The Kemp tank, while classified as a cruiser, is in fact slower than our fastest infantry tank, the Tulov Trident. Consequently, it is ill-suited to perform its role in our armoured doctrine, and the role of a fast cruiser still falls to the swift but otherwise hopelessly obsolete cruiser Mark IV, which has been retained solely on account of its ability to travel at 30 miles an hour on road. Now that Operation Sea Lion has been thwarted, the threat of invasion is gone, and we are enjoying some hard-earned breathing room. This then presents the ideal opportunity to replace the Kemp tank with a proper fast cruiser tank, to work alongside the other vehicles I have just mentioned. However, hitherto the most potent engine we have had available to us has been the Nuffield Liberty V12, with around 350 horsepower. This was adequate to propel the lightly armed and armoured cruiser tanks of yesterday to 30 miles an hour, but if we simply reuse the same engine, then we cannot expect to gain the improvements in armour and firepower that a year and a half of war demand. Furthermore, our commanding officers in the field tire of the Liberty's somewhat lacklustre reliability record. Therefore I determined that there was a pressing need for a more powerful motor for our fast tanks and took it upon myself to engage a worthy engineer to adapt an alternative engine for tank duty. As for the engine, it has long seemed to me that the Napier Lion engine should be utilised in our armoured vehicles. A 24-litre W12 aero engine from the end of the Great War, it is of the same origin as the Liberty, and yet produced over a hundred more horsepower when it was introduced, despite its smaller displacement. Furthermore, its W-cylinder arrangement makes for a shorter and more compact power pack which can only have advantageous connotations in the confines of a tank. The Lion's resume is also second to none. It has undergone continuous development throughout the 20s and 30s, and has seen use in all manner of high-performance planes, cars and boats. The latest production variants produce as much as 600 horsepower, and in race trim the Lion is good for over 900. Now, on pool petrol, and with the necessary simplifications to make it suitable for use in a tank, such outputs are never going to be possible but I am delighted to report that our very own Nikolai Tulov has been hard at work on this very project, and has a variant ready to go into production with 450 horsepower at 2000 RPM. You don't need me to tell you that this is a considerable upgrade from the Liberty L12, and should enable you to design a cruiser tank that is more capable of hauling sufficient firepower and armour to the 30 mile an hour target. Consequently, the War Office has drawn up the following specification for a new generation of fast cruiser tank. Speed is of the essence here. I have been asked to stress to you that a cruiser tank should specialise in mobility and firepower, 
to outflank and dispatch enemy tanks. They should not be sitting around relying on heavy armour to deflect incoming anti-tank rounds. So please, prioritise meeting and exceeding the requisite 30 mile an hour minimum speed over bolting on excessive amounts of armour. Firepower is of course taken care of for you, as the War Office has stipulated that the modernised OQF 12-pounder is to be used for this vehicle, thanks to its superior armour penetration capability. Not all of the parameters are entirely your choice if they are not listed in the specification. Vehicles that do not meet the fixed criteria in any of the categories will be disqualified, scoring zero for that category. So please, do read the specification very carefully before you set to work. Your deadline, ladies and gentlemen, is a fortnight from today, the 27th of June. Now, I've kept you here long enough, and I'm sure you'll be itching to get to grips with this new engine. Doubtless you'll find the power positively luxurious after some of the frankly anemic engines you've had to make do with in the past. To your drawing boards then, my good friends, and best of luck to each of you.